Okay, so now I'm going to talk about land acquisition for a few minutes. So there's two common ways that we have been able to acquire land data, so energy sources. Um, vibrator, which is more common nowadays, and dynamite, which is a little bit of an older, let's say, technology. Um, so here we've got a comparison between records from a very early uh, vibrator and dynamite shots. And so both of these data sets, it's kind of a fun study because both were acquired in the same area of southeast Montana. And so you could see on the left-hand side that the, the vibrator records, and then on the right-hand side, the dynamite shot records. And one thing you'll notice is that there's an improved signal-to-noise ratio in the vibrator records. Um, and it's pretty clear where you could see, um, let me turn on my pointer again, <laughs> um, where you could see some slightly more coherent reflections, A, B, and C kind of down here. And one thing to notice is that those are much harder to pick out in the dynamite acquired data. Of course, if we're used to, you're used to looking at 3D data or modern 2D data, you know, these would, you know, you kind of look at these and are like, oh man, that's gonna be hard to interpret on. Uh, there's a lot more uncertainty in these older records. Okay, so going on to the next slide. Um, Every survey has its kind of distinct kind of quality zones that we often talk about that directly impact the interpretation. So we often call this, what is the sweet spot that we're trying to image? And so you may have your target in that sweet spot, um, and then you have more of the, the fringe around the survey. So when you shoot your seismic survey, it's not saying, okay, well, my reservoir is in these uh, five square miles, so that's where my seismic has to be shot, but rather you have to build a bit of an area around that. And so that allows you to have larger offset angles. It also allows you to still maintain some of the, the fold that you'll need for stacking the data to remove noise. So always keep in mind that the seismic has to be a, a little bit larger than, than your reservoir itself. So this is an example um, of an image that shows actual fold coverage from a land survey. And so you can see how the fold builds up from the edges where it's much lighter, so less fold, um, all the way into the center where it gets a little, little bit darker and you have a higher fold. Um, areas of different fold will have different signal to noise ratios. So of course, that's something we have to keep in mind as we're interpreting our seismic data. So those lower fold areas may mean that we have less statistical noise reduction in the stacking process, and it can potentially make it harder to interpret the subtle features. Um, these stripe patterns that you see in the, the fold acquisition could also cause what we call acquisition artifacts in the seismic data itself, and I'll show you examples of that in later lectures, um, rather than geology. And so these we often refer to, like the striping pattern in 3D seismic, as our acquisition footprint. Survey geometry also can vary a lot in land acquisitions, and this is depending on the terrain, on the obstacles, on the cost constraints, even the equipment constraints. And so there's a couple of different variations. Um, one of these is cross-spread shooting, which I'm showing here, which was first done back in the 1970s. And then perimeter shooting is another method of shooting that involves the sources, which are the squares in this image. So you can see the, the squares are the sources, um, and they are kind of shot and placed around a regular or even an irregular area, depending on your what you're trying to shoot. Um, and typically the source and the receiver lines are coincident with each other, and all the receivers on the perimeter are recorded for all of the shots. And so this can make your 3D a little bit more flexible for undershooting obstacles like a house, <laughs> maybe, or a road or you know, anything that's, that's built around that you have to shoot under, um, but you can't necessarily access that land itself. And so um, kind of the figure on the right-hand side shows this idea and how it can work even for irregular receiver areas and geometries where we're trying to shoot around something. And so perimeter shooting is one way to get more CMP image coverage uh, with the least surface access and source effort. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about marine acquisition for a few minutes. And so this is a great image from Liner's textbook. I greatly recommend it. If you wanna learn more about these, he covers it in multiple chapters rather than 
five or 10 minutes like I am. And so uh, he has the, this image is just an excellent overview of marine seismic acquisition. And so you could see some of the key elements similar to the photographs I've been showing you of having a source vessel that's towing air gun arrays and then also towing long hydrophone streamers. And so they can cover the ocean um, surface in many different ways. Uh, one of the more common ways is to do it in kind of a racetrack pattern. <laughs> so going back and forth, dragging those streamers. And so the vessels will typically follow very carefully planned sail lines to ensure proper coverage of the target area. And so these are just a few photos um, of that seismic survey that I did in the Gulf of Mexico um, from the ship that we used. And you can see the streamers coming off of it. So several of them are towing streamers. I think they were roughly six kilometers um, with the geophones placed every 25 meters, but it's also towing the air gun and you could kind of see it um, right here. It's a little bit more of a wider feature. Um, one of the issues we had to deal with is that we already, this was a 4D survey that we were requiring. So we had to work around the existing platform. Um, and that meant we did two phases of seismic shooting. We did the outside area, and then we had to come in with some smaller vessels um, and a separate vessel with a separate source, and then our vessel with the receivers so that we could work around the platform. So here's some actual equipment from that same survey um, that I did that's used in marine acquisition. Um, so we've got the air guns up on the air gun deck, so some of the extra ones they had on hand. Um, the streamer deck with all the extra streamers. Um, this was the Western GECO Tasman that I was on, and so at the time this was their data QC center. And I took this picture of the live data <laughs> when I was on the ship because I was just kind of impressed with how noisy it looks and how this is what it originally looks like before it's turned into the amazing images that we're able to interpret. So one of the things we, I mentioned that we have to be careful of are the ocean currents in marine acquisition. So they're a major challenge. And so shown in this illustration, those currents can cause streamer feathering, where the streamers drift off from their intended kind of straight line path that we would do in our perfect world. <laughs> Um, and so this affects our subsurface coverage and is another thing that we have to account for during, during processing. And if we can't account for all of it during processing, we have to account for it during our interpretation. Ocean bottom cables are great if you can afford them. <laughs> so they're a wonderful alternative. And these are where you have the cables that are laid directly on the seafloor and they contain both hydrophones and geophones. Um, and so this provides a lot better low frequency response because um, you don't have to deal with the signal coming back up from the subsurface through the ocean column. Um, it also allows us to record both the pressure and the shear wave, something we can't do on the streamers. Um, although I mentioned before, the deployment can be more complex, time consuming, which means more expensive. And then ocean bottom nodes are another seafloor recording technology. So this is where individual nodes can be placed in areas, typically where the cables may be impractical, like around subsea infrastructure. And so they provide, you know, very good data quality, but are, are even more expensive to deploy and then also to retrieve after the, the acquisition is done. And so this is a nice comparison, just showing the difference between two uh, marine acquisition methods. So we've got the traditional streamer acquisition on the left and then ocean bottom nodes on the right hand side. And so you can see how the different acquisition methods affect the imaging capability in the final product. So notice how the ocean bottom method seems to provide some better illumination of the more complex structure over here, kind of circled in yellow <laughs> to highlight it, um, than we see in the streamer data. And so this is another comparison of uh, subsalt images um, kind of at the Miocene level. I think these are subsalt images at the Miocene level. Um, in the case of the toad streamer, we're on the top part. And then our OBS, we have uh, data on the bottom part. And one of the things you'll notice is that we've got higher resolution 
with the OBSs, um, we also had wide azimuth node imaging with them compared to the more narrow azimuth toad streamer image. So again, depending on what you're trying to uh, detect to image, the level of confidence that you need to have with your interpretation, using a more advanced collection method could be ideal. And so the last thing, kind of the next to last thing I want to mention with acquisition is that geometry really matters. So depending on if you shoot your seismic survey uh, parallel to faults that you may know about or perpendicular to the faults, um, that can totally change the appearance of them in seismic data. And so this is an example of two different geometries of a seismic acquisition uh, from the Hart textbook, showing that you end up illuminating those features differently in the subsurface. Um, you know, on, in this case, I would be much more confident picking the faults on the left-hand side than I would on the right-hand side. And so acquisition footprint is something that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And so those are those artifacts in our data that result from um, our acquisition geometry that we chose. And they are, for the most part, quite unavoidable, and you'll see them very, very commonly. And so these patterns, if you're not aware of them, they can sometimes be mistaken for geologic features. And so one of the first things I do when I open up a seismic uh, cube <laughs> in, in my interpretation software is I scroll through it and I look for that seismic acquisition footprint to know how bad it is and, and how much I need to deal with it in my interpretation. And so that's one of the main reasons and main things we want to be aware of when we're trying to understand how the acquisition parameters affect our data interpretation. And so just a few concepts I'll just kind of go over really quick. So hopefully you've noticed that survey geometry really affects um, your, your seismic. Um, it matters if you have different azimuthal coverages. So you could have narrow azimuth or wider azimuth. Um, other things are your data artifacts, your acquisition artifacts may mimic geologic structures. And if you have better azimuthal coverage, you'll get better imaging of the more complex structures. And you always want to check the acquisition. Um, if you have access to the acquisition and processing reports, you can look at maps of where the data was collected, how it was collected, and that might help you understand better any unusual features that you come across. Uh, when you're interpreting. Thanks for listening.